This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 49. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's Dragonfly mission to search for life on Titan, the Neutrino Observatory at the bottom of the sea, and science gets a reality check on its attempts to detect Earth-impacting asteroids. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has announced a new mission to study the unique, richly organic world of Titan. Titan is Saturn's largest moon. It's also the second biggest moon in the solar system. In fact, it's even larger than the planet Mercury. It's the only world in the solar system other than Earth, where clouds rain liquid onto the ground, forming streams and rivers that flow into lakes and seas. But unlike Earth's water-based hydrological cycle, Titan has a hydrocarbon cycle with rains of methane and ethane. In fact, on Titan, temperatures are so cold that water is frozen so hard it forms bedrock. Like Earth, Titan's atmosphere is primarily nitrogen. But unlike Earth and its oxygen, Titan's atmosphere is laced with methane and ethane. All this forms a dense hydrocarbon haze high in the moon's stratosphere, where it's destroyed by sunlight. And that's the sort of chemical soup which astronomers think the early Earth had. They therefore think Titan may be an analogue for the very early Earth, and maybe even provide clues about how life arose on Earth. And so, they want to explore this shrouded world, hidden beneath its veil of hydrocarbon clouds, in far greater detail than what was possible with Cassini or its Huygens lander, which descended down onto the Titan's surface in 2005, becoming the first spacecraft to land on a world of the outer solar system. The new mission, known as Dragonfly, will involve the deployment of an autonomous rotorcraft drone that will fly around Titan, carrying out multiple sorties to sample and examine sites around the icy moon. Dragonfly will launch in 2026, arriving in the Saturnian system eight years later in 2034. The rotorcraft will fly to dozens of promising locations on Titan, looking for prebiotic chemicals common to both Titan and Earth. Dragonfly marks the first time that NASA will fly a multi-rotor vehicle for science on another world. It has eight rotors and flies very much like a large drone. It'll take advantage of Titan's dense atmosphere, four times denser than Earth's, to become the first vehicle ever to fly its entire science payload to new places for repeatable and targeted access to surface materials. During its 2.7-year primary mission, Dragonfly will explore diverse environments, from organic dunes to the floor of an impact basin where liquid water and complex organic materials which are key to life once existed together for possibly tens of thousands of years. Its instruments will study how far prebiotic chemistry may have progressed. Dragonfly will also investigate the Moon's atmospheric and surface properties and its subsurface ocean and liquid reservoirs. Additionally, instruments will search for chemical evidence of past life. Dragonfly will take advantage of 13 years' worth of Cassini data. It's allowed scientists to select a calm weather period to land, along with a safe initial landing site, as well as scientifically interesting targets. It'll initially land on the equatorial Shangri-La dune fields, which are terrestrially similar to the linear dunes of Namibia in southern Africa. Dragonfly will initially explore this region in short flights, building up to a series of longer leapfrog flights up to 8 kilometres, and stopping along the way to take samples from compelling areas with diverse geography. It will ultimately reach the Selk Impact Crater. Here, there's evidence of past liquid water, as well as organics there, the complex molecules that contain carbon, combined with hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen, and energy, which together make up the recipe for life as we know it. Mission managers estimate the lander will eventually fly more than 175 kilometres. That's nearly double the distance travelled to date by all the Mars rovers combined. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine says the Moon's weather and surface processes have combined complex organics, energy and water similar to those that may have sparked life on Earth. As it orbits Saturn, Titan is about 1.4 billion kilometres away from the Sun. That's some 10 times further away than the Earth. And because it's so far away from the sun, its surface temperature is a chilly minus 179 degrees Celsius. All in all, what promises to be an interesting mission, with fascinating science to be gleaned. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. (music) 
Astronomers are using a huge underwater telescope at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea to study neutrinos generated by some of the most powerful and mysterious events in the universe. When complete, the KM3Net telescope will be located at two deep-sea sites at depths of up to 3,500 metres. They'll occupy more than a cubic kilometre of water and comprise hundreds of vertical detection lines anchored to the seabed and held in place by buoys. Each line has 18 modules equipped with light sensors along its length, and in the darkness of the deep ocean, these sensors register the faint flashes of a special light that signals the interaction of neutrinos with seawater. The KM3 net needed to be incredibly sensitive because the light detected from the neutrino interactions is about as faint as light from a light bulb in Sydney seen in Perth. That's the same as a light bulb in New York seen from Los Angeles. One of the scientists behind the project, Dr Clancy James from Curtin University and the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research, says such a huge volume of water is needed to surround the instruments because neutrinos are so incredibly difficult to detect. Neutrinos are elemental subatomic particles generated through radioactive decay in stars, supernovae, nuclear explosions, particle accelerators and atomic reactors. The neutrino is so named because it's electrically neutral and because its rest mass is so small it was long thought to be zero. Neutrinos are the most common form of matter in the universe and having almost no mass are capable of being accelerated to almost the speed of light. Neutrinos come in three known types or flavours, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos, each with their own specific properties and masses. And what makes neutrinos really fascinating is that they change oscillating between these flavours. For example, an electron neutrino produced in a beta decay reaction may wind up interacting in a distant detector as a muon or tau neutrino. Although they have no electric charge, neutrinos do have their own corresponding antimatter counterparts, identified through their opposite chirality or handedness. Neutrinos interact with other matter only through gravity and the weak nuclear force. But when I say interact, it really is a relative term when it comes to neutrinos. In fact, neutrinos are so weakly interactive that several million of them pass through you every second without you ever noticing. While neutrinos rarely interact, when they hit water, they can generate light, which the KM3 net telescope's able to detect. But the underwater telescope is constantly being bombarded by millions upon millions of different particles. So how can it differentiate what's a neutrino compared to something else? Well, because neutrinos are so weakly interactive, they can literally pass right through the Earth. So the telescope's designed to only detect subatomic particles passing up through the Earth from the other side of the planet, reaching the detector from below. And with the detector located in the Mediterranean Sea, it means the neutrino source must be in the skies above Australia. And that's where Professor James and Curtin University comes in. They'll use telescopes such as the Murchison Wide Field Array to study the origins of neutrinos seen by the KM3 net. James says the project will help scientists answer some major questions about particle physics, as well as the nature of the universe, potentially ushering in a new era of neutrino astronomy. Neutrinos are the most common type of massive, well, I say massive particle in the universe, particle that has mass, but they almost never interact with things. We each have something like, you know, 10 to the 12 passing through us every second of that order from the sun. So the neutrinos are produced in nuclear reactions. The ones we're trying to look for are produced by high energy particle interactions going on in the universe somewhere. So I'm sure you're familiar with the Large Hadron Collider and, you know, this atom smasher smashing together particles at, you know, very high energies. Well, this is happening out there in the universe, but at even higher energies, right? We know this is happening from the observations of things with cosmic rays. So this is from things like supernova explosions and... Yes. The fact that it's being positioned in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, exactly opposite where Australia is, is, is that deliberate or is that just a coincidence? It's a coincidence. The reason it's there is simply because it's a collaboration of European institutes. And if you want to uh, build an instrument, it's easier to do it nearby. So the main constraint you need is to get this thing down deep, right? You need it to be deep down in the water for two reasons. One, so it's dark. So when you do sort of an estimate of the amount of light that you get detected, so what happens is a neutrino, if it does interact, will produce a burst of light and that light is extremely faint. So you might only detect uh, maybe a dozen photons from that collision. So you need it to be in a really dark place. And 
you don't actually get it to be dark enough unless you're more than a kilometre under the surface of the water. The other reason is that these cosmic rays I mentioned earlier, these are high energy particles from space, they're hitting the top of our atmosphere all the time and they produce more particles that then sort of rain down on us at sea level and some of these particles called muons can actually go through kilometres of stuff. Right. They actually don't get stopped very easily at all. And so what you want to do is shield yourself from as many of these muons as possible by going deeper and deeper. Now, you can't shield yourself from all of them. So KM3Net will detect something like uh, a million of these muons a day, but nonetheless, it's much easier to do at the surface. So the reason it's being built at the bottom of the Mediterranean is that there's some sufficiently deep places there to do this experiment. Why is it important that Australia is at the opposite end of the Earth from where this experiment's taking place? The particles that new, uh, that KM3Net are detecting neutrinos, you know, they interact very rarely, and we expect KM3Net to only detect maybe of order dozens per year. However, there's also particles from these cosmic ray interactions that hit the top of the atmosphere muons and come down. So what this means is that the detector is saturated by about a million muon events a day coming down from above. However, only neutrinos can actually make it up from under the detector. So the best way of saying, okay, we detected this particle, was it a neutrino or was it something else, is to look for particles coming up underneath, from underneath the detector, coming up through the Earth, at which point you can say, well, the only thing that could have possibly made it through the whole Earth to the detector was a neutrino. So what this means is that neutrino telescopes mostly look downwards through the Earth as opposed to you know, normal telescopes when you point them up at the sky above you. And so the sky, the region of the universe that KM3Net will be studying is the region of the universe that's visible from normal telescopes on the opposite side of the world. That is to say... Australia, which means that the sky that Australian telescopes are viewing is exactly the same sky that KM3Net's viewing all the time. Is there a reason why you've chosen liquid water rather than solid water, and such as the South Pole neutrino detector, which is in... in yeah, exactly. Nice? So, so IceCube is the name of the instrument you're referring to. So that's the one that first discovered this sort of high energy flux of neutrinos coming from the universe. So the two reasons we chose in water, one, it's just practical. It's there, you know, when you're building, when you're putting a large amount of money into an instrument, you have a trade-off between what's nearby and, you know, the most optimum site ever. But the main reason actually is that it turns out that water is an excellent medium to do this in because it absorbs more light than ice. So you want to detect light from these faint neutrinos, but light gets absorbed in water with a length of scale of, say, 50 metres, whereas in ice, a photon might bounce around for 200 metres before it gets absorbed. However, if you ever, like, stand on top of the snow and look into ice versus stand on top of water and look down, you see further into water, mm -hmm. right? And this is because um, water doesn't scatter light as much. So what this means is when, when a neutrino interacts, it emits the light in a characteristic cone shape, right? It comes out with a cone with an opening angle of about 30 degrees. This is Cherenkov radiation. Um, you ever had the pleasure of looking into a nuclear reactor by chance? There's one not far from where I live at a place called Lucas Heights, Lucas Heights. which is in Sydney. Yep. That blue Cherenkov radiation yep. light. I saw it in a reactor in Indonesia once on a tour. But yes, it's exactly the kind of light that we're detecting. This light comes from high energy particles that have been, in this case, emitted by radioactivity and KM3Net emitted from the interaction of the neutrino. And because they're going really fast through the water, they emit a shock wave, just like a um, supersonic jet emits a shockwave and that shockwave comes across in blue light whereas a supersonic jet shockwave comes across in terms of a sharp crack of sound. That's Dr Clancy James from Curtin University and the International Centre for Radio Astronomy Research. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers have successfully detected a potentially threatening near-Earth object or NEO, but they were only able to confirm that it would hit the planet after it had already impacted. Scientists have long known that if life on Earth was to be wiped out by a natural disaster, the impact of an asteroid or comet would be the most likely cause. The good news is that unlike volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, tsunami, megastorms or other natural disasters, an asteroid or comet impact is the one event, given enough advance warning, where science has the technology to try and prevent Armageddon. But scientists have just had a rather disturbing reality check on that assumption. On the 22nd of June, infrasound sensors operated by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization detected a major explosion above the Atlantic Ocean. But the massive blast, which happened south of Puerto Rico, wasn't a thermonuclear device, but an air-bursting asteroid. The four-metre-wide asteroid exploded with the equivalent of three to five kilotons of TNT. 
The asteroid, catalogued as 2019 MO, had been detected 12 hours earlier, about half a million kilometres from Earth, by the Atlas Survey Telescopes. These initial observations were assessed by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and the asteroid was given a modest impact rating of 2. A rating of 4 means a likely Earth impact. So, this was something people weren't too worried about. However, the atmospheric infrasound detection in Puerto Rico 12 hours later caused some scientists to search for more data, eventually finding additional observations of the object from the PANSTARS-2 survey telescope. With these additional data, the asteroid's overall trajectory and entry path prediction were improved significantly, and new calculations increased the impact rating from 2 to 4, in other words, a likely hit. The improved orbital calculations also matched the infrasound detection with a very high likelihood. Then, further investigations turned up new data from the next rad weather radar in San Juan, Puerto Rico. It turns out it detected 2019 MO as it burnt up in the atmosphere, and observations from weather satellites high in orbit were also able to image the rock's fragmentation. But of course, all this came after the event. The lesson to be learned here is that constant monitoring using multiple sources is needed in order to accurately tie down the trajectory of a potentially deadly impactor. Luckily, on this occasion, it was a small 4-metre asteroid, and not something 10 or 100 times larger. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Residents of Chile and Argentina have just experienced a spectacular sunset solar eclipse. And from an astronomical point of view, it was even better, with a path of totality crossing almost directly above the European Southern Observatory's La Silla Observatory in Chile. And it also passed close to the centre of Buenos Aires in Argentina. A solar eclipse occurs when the Earth passes through a shadow cast by the Moon, which fully or partially blocks or occults the Sun. And this can only happen when the Sun, Moon and Earth are nearly aligned on a straight line in three dimensions during a new Moon when the Moon is close to the ecliptical plane. The ecliptic is the plane upon which the Earth orbits the Sun. The other important thing is that right now in our solar system's history, the Sun's distance from Earth is about 400 times the Moon's distance from Earth, and the Sun's diameter just happens to be 400 times that of the Moon. Now, because these ratios are approximately the same, the Sun and the Moon as seen from Earth appear to be approximately the same size, about half a degree of arc in angular measure. In a total eclipse, the disk of the Sun is fully obscured by the Moon. Of course, if the Moon were in a perfectly circular orbit and on the same orbital plan as the Earth, then there'd be total solar eclipses every new Moon. However, since the Moon's orbit is tilted at a bit more than 5 degrees to the Earth's orbit around the Sun, its shadow usually misses the Earth. The other thing is that the Moon's orbit around the Earth is also slightly elliptical, so its distance from Earth varies. And because Earth's orbit around the Sun is also elliptical, Earth's distance from the Sun similarly varies throughout the year. Now, this affects the apparent size of the Sun in the same way, but not as much as it does the Moon's varying distance from the Earth. When the Moon approaches Apogee, its furthest distance from the Earth, and of course that happened this month, a total eclipse is somewhat more likely whereas conditions favour an annular eclipse when the Earth approaches perigee at its closest distance to the Sun in early January. What all this means is that the good citizens of Argentina and Chile were able to sit back, relax, and enjoy a perfect evening solar eclipse. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. The heatwave broiling Europe at the moment has just set a new record, with France reaching its highest temperature since records began. Meteo France says temperatures reached a record 45.9 degrees Celsius, almost two degrees above the previous record set in 2003, which killed more than 70,000 people across the continent. Mainland Europe has been sweltering for days under the record-breaking temperatures, caused by hot air moving north from the Sahara. Meteorologists are attributing this change in weather patterns to climate change, saying it's absolutely consistent with what's predicted by the impact of greenhouse gas emissions. And Europe isn't the only place suffering with dangerous heat waves. India and Pakistan have been sweltering since mid-May under one of the longest-lasting heat waves in recent history. In fact, temperatures in New Delhi have soared to a June record of 48 degrees Celsius, with at least 180 people having reportedly died from heat-related causes. A new study warns that being exposed to solvents while pregnant could raise the risk of your child having autism. 
The findings reported in the Journal of Occupational and Environmental Medicine is based on investigations of 750 mothers and 891 fathers' exposure to 16 different chemical agents. Scientists found that mothers of kids with autism had been more frequently exposed to solvents compared to those who didn't have children on the spectrum. However, the authors stressed that after correcting for statistical bias, the observed associations were not significant. Israeli intelligence has discovered that Russia was behind a sudden spate of GPS failures over Ben Gurion Airport. Airport authorities say the GPS signal used by pilots has been experiencing interference for the past three weeks. Moscow's hacking has forced pilots to use conventional ALS or instrument landing systems instead. Air traffic controllers say aircraft safety was never an issue as they were able to provide full guidance for all flights. These new revelations follow ward condemnation over the Russian military's downing of Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 with a surface-to-air missile over the eastern Ukraine, killing all 298 people on board, and Moscow's attempted murder of Sergei Skripal in Salisbury, England, using a Novichok chemical nerve agent. That botched murder attempt resulted in the hospitalisation of several people, including one woman who later died. The fossilised remains of one of the largest non-dinosaurian birds ever discovered have been found in a cave on the Crimean Peninsula. A report in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology claims the bird's estimated to have weighed around 450 kilograms. That's more than 10 times the weight of an emu and around double the weight of the extinct New Zealand moa. It's the first time a bird of such a huge size has been reported from anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere. The flightless bird was around 3.5 metres tall and lived between 15 and 2 million years ago. A new study says it's time for people to free their feet, take your shoes off and walk barefoot. The findings reported in the journal Nature are based on a small study of 81 Kenyan and 22 Americans. Scientists found that modern cushion-soled shoes reduce sensitivity and alter the forces transmitted from your feet to your joints. While foot calluses, built up by walking barefoot, protect the soles of the feet without compromising sensitivity or gait. Researchers found that calluses tend to be thicker and harder in people who habitually walk barefoot compared with people who regularly wear shoes. They also found that footwear affects impact forces from the foot striking the ground, delivering more energy to the joints than what's seen in thick calloused individuals. The authors say further studies needed in order to determine what effect this might have on the human skeleton. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 